Hello, and welcome to the Healthy Work Podcast, hosted by the Healthy Work Research Unit at Aston University. I'm your host and head of the research unit, Simon McCabe. Today's guest is Dr. Isabella Moore. Dr. Moore earned her PhD from Aston University. Her work has focused on later life entrepreneurship, with a particular focus on the gendered aspects of setting up a business at a mature age. Dr. Moore is an entrepreneur herself, having set up and run Comtech translations for 40 years, while buying and selling several businesses along the way. In 2022, Dr. Moore launched the Olderpreneur Alliance, a community interest company dedicated to supporting, training, encouraging, and advocating for aspiring later-life entrepreneurs. We're delighted to have her with us today to discuss her work and to connect it to health and well-being. Dr. Moore, welcome. Hello. Hello. Glad to be here. Good stuff. So uh, we'd like to launch these things with you just telling us a little bit about yourself. So before we jump into the nitty-gritty of your PhD and your more recent work, can you kind of just give us a little bit about your background, what got you into this area and kind of how did you end up where you are now? Okay, well, it's a long story. If I say that uh, my thesis for my master's was on 18th century church pulpits in Central Europe, it hasn't got much to do with entrepreneurship, but it's, uh, it's as I said, a long story. I, um, I'm half Polish and I was at St Andrews University and I had the opportunity of um, a, a sort of funded place at Warsaw University. And this was still under communism, uh, Poland. But I decided I needed to explore a little bit my heritage. So off I went to do history of art there. Hence the the church pulpits in 18th century uh, Central Europe. And uh, at the time, Poland was beginning to... Um, establish uh, technology transfer contracts with Western companies. And uh, I uh, was recruited to work for an American construction company. This was after I completed my degree. I didn't have a lot of money needed to earn some. So I went off at the age of about 24, 25 to work in this large construction site as an interpreter, because obviously my knowledge of Polish at the time had vastly increased having to write essays and and, and, and and my dissertation in Polish. So, um, yeah, so I was recruited as a translator interpreter. For some reason, the site manager was uh, fired and I was given the job at the age of 24 of looking after this construction site, which was uh, an experience in itself. Uh, and at the time, Massey Ferguson, the tractor uh, the, the, there was a large tractor factory here. It was, because it's no longer here, uh, in Coventry. And um, they signed a technology transfer contract with uh, the Polish equivalent. And I was headhunted by the British Embassy, having heard about my work working for this American construction company. I went off to run a liaison office with, uh, with uh, for Massey Ferguson in Nurses. Um, all the time, obviously, using my language a bit. If you can, if you can imagine, uh, my knowledge of terminology was around art history, not specialist technical terms. So I had quite a large learning curve, and that was where I met my husband, who was um, who was responsible for installing computer systems there from Massey Ferguson, and hence how I found myself not back in Scotland but here in the Midlands. And um, using that language skill, really, and having that, um, I worked for um, several years uh, for Massey Ferguson here in the West Midlands, looking after uh, groups that were coming over for high level training. And that really got me thinking about um, the possibility of why not try other languages and hence, I, I set up at Comtech. And there was another big reason why I did this at the time. It's very different now, but at the time, I um, there was no sort of there are there were no facilities as there are now nurseries, all the sort of childcare that there is now, and I needed the flexibility really to bring up a young family, and so that was also one of the reasons. And I think women of my generation often set up in business precisely for that reason because they needed that flexibility. They couldn't take a nine to five job because they didn't have the childcare. I didn't have my family with me, so there was no other choice. And so that was how I set up Comtech. And over the years, um, 
I worked very hard to uh, develop the company using as much help as I could. I was always the first one to sign up for any business support program. And I uh, was, I ensured that we were certified to all the usual standards. And um, also in parallel with that, I became involved with the Chamber of Commerce movement and I became the first woman president of Coventry and Warwickshire Chamber and um, also um, nationally the BCC and deputy president of the European Chambers of Commerce. So I was always, I was always interested in the sort of impact of public policy regulation on small business. So that was my other sort of area of interest. And also promoting language learning in in schools. We're so bad in this country about language learning, you know, and I always say you can buy in English, but you can't sell in English. So that was my other area. And supporting women's enterprise, really understanding that, you know, however much we 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 think we are, but at the time, and I think the situation has changed quite considerably, but we're still not there, is that it is more difficult for a woman to, to, to set up in business for all the reasons that I have just, you know, said there are other pressures which uh, perhaps their male counterparts don't have. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so I worked on the business, developed it, and then I had the opportunity of selling it. And I sold it to an American concern and went off to be chief executive of an organization that supported the learning languages of school. It was a a government quango at the time and also promoting language learning among companies, exporters. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, yeah, so I worked there for several years and it was a chance telephone call from the owners, the American owners, who said, look, we don't feel we've taken the company where we want it to be. You've got lots of contacts in the language industry. Could you help us sell it? Yeah. And I, it was just a eureka moment. My daughter at the time had uh, was working as a management consultant down in London. I picked up the phone to her and said, it was just a sort of moment. Do you fancy buying it back again? Mm-hmm. And so we did. We bought the business back again. And um, so at the age of 60, I found myself in a very different, it's taken me a long time to get there, but you know, this is, this is the story. Um, At the age of 60, I find myself with a very different set of issues than I had found setting up a business in my 30s. So I had an aging mother who lived abroad. My mother was Polish. When my father died, she moved back to Warsaw. Um, and she was in her 90s, no, late 80s at the time. Um, I had young grandchildren and I very much wanted to, to remain involved in, in helping to look after them. And I also had a husband who was retired and really felt that he didn't really understand why I wanted to continue working. Mm-hmm. And so I sort of began to think about these issues. What what um you know what impact do these problems have on somebody thinking in later life about setting up in business and it was a chance conversation with professor mark hart who said well why don't you come along and do um a, a phd on this subject mm-hmm. and so i did and so that's what really that's the journey to the point where i i i i, I started that uh, research yeah mm-hmm. So you mentioned there a couple of things that I think, well, you can tell me, I suppose. So yeah. you mentioned about starting the, the company kind of as a result of having children. Yeah. That was kind of one of the solutions is because it provided the flexibility to you. And you also mentioned kind of the attitudes towards women and, and different things in business as well. So how did that translate and what was the appeal of a PhD? So that's the first question is kind of why did it appeal to you in the first place? And can you tell us more about what you ended up studying? Okay, well, well, perhaps just to answer that first part of of the question, I mean, I remember when I used to, I, I joined the Chamber of Commerce movement in order to get the contacts I needed because obviously I was selling a language service to um, to exporters. So where would I find exporters? So I thought to myself, well, it's the Chamber of Commerce. And so that's why I became a member of the Chamber of Commerce. But I do recall when I used to attend the networking events, I always, um, you know, 
think about it, usually the only other woman there was, and this is going back quite a few years, was the lady that perhaps was, you know, serving the buffet or, or the sandwiches. Mm. So there were very few women at the time actually um, able to, to get involved in sort of organisations like the Chamber of Commerce. The meetings were usually early evening. If you had children, obviously, um, you know, that, that in itself would be a barrier. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as I said, you did, you know, you having your own business. And I, I suppose I just persevered with that is that, um, you know, you need that flexibility. You won't ever get that same flexibility if you have a paid job. Mm -hmm. You know, perhaps working as an academic is, 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 is another. But at the time, that wasn't something that I even considered. So it's the oh, it was at the time the only way that you could have that flexibility to be able to stop at three, go and pick the, the children up, or perhaps take the day off, or just work part you know part time. So mm -hmm. yeah, and why I wanted to, why I felt uh, I've always, as I said, I've always been interested in issues and problems. So you know, in my Chamber of Commerce where I was did a lot of lobbying on behalf of small businesses in Brussels uh, with, at the time, it was the Tony Blair government. So I was down in London often and also obviously as president of the British Chambers of Commerce, lobbying on issues that affected small, small business. So, you know, when I found myself at the age of 60 with all this new bunch of issues, you know, that's what I think. Well, I, I just want to understand that a bit better. I just want to see why, you know, what. And and I also felt, I think that's one one thing I haven't mentioned, that once you reach a certain age, say it's 60, you know, you do find that you lose a bit of your identity. You've been working all your life. You've been doing this. And then suddenly, oh, it's not there anymore or or. And I just felt that that also is was something interesting to explore, Absolutely. and and the sort of stereotypes that people have about older people. You know, this whole issue of, oh, once you reach a certain age, it's the beginning of the big decline. Right. Well, it's not like that at all. Yeah. So yeah, it doesn't have to be. So, no. I mean, Sam and I spoke last week about yeah. this idea of retirement. Many people have this idea that it's going to be fantastic, and then the reality of it is is much different from expectation. But I want to return to the PhD yes, and particularly kind of what you did and, and in particular because it's the Healthy Work podcast, any yeah. of the health or well-being angles that kind of tumbled out of it? Yes, very much so. So I looked at, I looked at um, three areas. First of all, I looked at motivation. I looked, why would you want to set up in business in later life? And I mean, just to, just to say my, I originally was going to do a mixed methods research, but my data that I had from interviews that I had with a sort of half and half. It was half men, half women. And um, it, it was so rich and so much that I think everybody felt that it would be sufficient. To, um, you know, it didn't need, for the time being, it didn't need that mixed methods and that just doing qualitative research was, was enough. Um, so I looked at motives why would you want to start in business in later life? And I had some very interesting uh, findings from that. Um, well, first of all, it's very rarely one reason. You know, it's not just to earn more money, although especially for women, that was a big issue because 70% of women of a certain age only have the state pension to, to live on. So that was, but... It was usually a mixture of things. And one of theirs, especially among the men that I interviewed, was an anxiety and concern that as they retired or didn't have a job in later life, their cognitive skills would decline. Mm -hmm. So that was a that was a really that came across very strongly. Um it was, a, it was something that the men that I interviewed said more than the women. Mm -hmm. The women, I think, um, were more used to change. Mm -hmm. And so they were perhaps, you know, because of having to break work, you know, they, they didn't sort of, that wasn't a concern at all. But among the men that I interviewed, certainly it was that sort of concern that their cognitive skills 
I remember one gentleman that I interviewed said that he had a, in his um, family, he had a history of dementia. And he felt strongly that, that by setting up and running his own business, that would sort of steve it off. Mm-hmm. And I think there is something, I think there's something here, there's a strong message here that is, you know, the fact that, you know, people have this expectation of retirement, as you just said, where, oh, it's going to be great, I'll be able to do the garden, I'll be able to go golfing every other day. Mm -hmm. But actually, there's a limit to how much you can do of that. And what came across for me strongly was the fact that People wanted to feel relevant. Yeah. And that relevance you don't get from doing gardening or, (laughs) and I think that, and so by setting up that business gave them a sense of relevance. Mm -hmm. And what about the the two other strands? Yeah. So there was motivation. Then I looked at sort of stereotypes. I looked at how does society perceive um, uh, uh, older people? And it was interesting. It was very much as I had expected that. You know, people would, I mean, I, I even came across a view from one of the interviewees who said that he'd he'd broached the subject of setting up his business, that it was a sort of deviant activity, actually setting up a business and, you know, what on earth are you doing this for? Yeah. So, you know, that was interesting, that sort of attitude that it was somehow... Rebellious. Yeah, yeah, rebellious and a bit mentally unstable <laughs> that you would even think in your later life to set up a business. And then there's also the sort of stereotypes that, that, that people have. I think I mentioned earlier about the fact that, um, you know, this is the beginning of the big decline. Mm-hmm. And, you know, th- this is it. It's, it's, it's a sort of mindset. And again, this, you know, that is, I think, very closely linked to the whole, the issue of well-being is that you know that mindset is um it, it's a sort of mental state isn't it and and you know if if you feel well I can't do this at this time of my life you're sort of you know you're putting unnecessary barriers and it's really about exploring why you know why you feel that but generally you know, society very much kept everything in sort of that it, it was more it was more acceptable for men to set up in business than it than it was for women. Um, women were very much around. Well, you know, at that age, you should be looking after your elderly parents or your grandchildren, and there's really not much room. You know, I I don't see how a woman would be able to mm-hmm. to to do that. So that was the second. And then the third area I looked at were the resources you need for um, for uh, setting up a business. And I divided them into tangible and intangible resources. So just quickly on the tangible ones, it was around, obviously, the, the, the financial resources you might have and how you might get them. The sort of business support that was out there for you to access. And it was interesting that most of the people I interviewed felt that the existing offer really didn't meet their requirements. They had, um, you know, they had interviews with people that were 30 years younger than that made them feel very inadequate and that they felt they hadn't been taken seriously. And, um, and it just, they didn't, they felt that the, the people that they saw really didn't didn't sort of understand their particular sort of issues and problems, and it was very generic in the way that they that 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 they were dealt with. But most interestingly, was around the intangible resources, mm-hmm. um, and here again, health and. The, the mental and physical health came out very strongly. I think everyone I interviewed understood the importance of maintaining good physical health and mental health mm-hmm. um, if you were going to set up in business because one of the biggest barriers was around confidence, mm-hmm. the confidence to set up a business. I remember some of these people had had perhaps a bruising experience in in um in their earlier career. They might have 
had to leave their job because of ageist attitudes, because it was, it, it, you know, they, they, they felt that, um, that they would, I mean, I remember one particular lady said, I will never work for anyone else again. My experience was so distressing. And so when they leave their employment, they're not always in a good mental state to even think about, you know, setting up in business. So exploring that and trying to understand that accepting is part of that sort of process to, in my view, to potentially get them thinking about that this is an option. Absolutely. Yeah. So I already know quite a little bit about this, but for our listeners, uh, can you explain that you recently set up the Olderpreneur Alliance? Can you talk about what it is, what, what motivated for you to do it? And again, uh, the health and well-being angles. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I was always aware that, you know, that this, I mean, I wanted to understand from my own perspective what is going on when you reach a certain, you know, what are the changes and what how your perspective changes towards setting up a business. But I really felt that, um, you know, doing this research needs to lead to somewhere just to have the impact that is so necessary. I mean, what's the point of doing it? So I think with the findings I had, um, I just felt very strongly that I needed to do something. You know, I I have my own example to go by, so it's not sort of, you know, so I I felt I really needed to, 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 to get this message across and um, and so I set up a community interest company called the Olderpreneur Alliance and on the basis of these findings I designed a program called the Later Creator so it's very much it's uh, first of all perhaps I'll tell you what it's not yeah. it's not about business planning it's not about cash flow it's not about marketing it's about understanding what the barriers are to even considering this option. Mm-hmm. And I, after I finished my research, I wanted to validate some of it. So I did a, a, a survey which went to 5,000 people in this age bracket just to confirm. I just felt I just needed a little, a wider confirmation of what my research findings were. And uh, one of the things that came out very strongly was that people in this in, in this sort of age bracket, in, in in this demographic, often went for jobs for which they were vastly overqualified. And and why? It's because they felt nobody wanted me and they were going for jobs just to, they needed the money, but they didn't even consider that, you know, well, I'm no point in, they didn't even, I think, think about what they have to bring to the table and the skills and experience I called age capital. Mm -hmm. So it's what age capital they have to be able to offer a potential employer. Mm -hmm. So the later creator is not only about considering, because not everybody's going to set up a business, you know, I mean, that's not going to be an option for everyone. But it's very much about um, getting to the point where you understand what your age capital is Mm -hmm. and being able to, feel confident enough to either go and get the sort of employment that reflects your skills and, and, and experience or be confident enough to be able to access this sort of business support is out there to take you to the next level. Mm-hmm. So that's the, and that's the purpose. And also the other aim of, of the Entrepreneur Alliance is just to raise awareness about, I mean, I think Obviously, there has to be an emphasis on supporting young people. It's our future and we need to do that. But there's a lot of people out there. I think I read a s- statistic that by 2040, there'll be s- several more million people of pensionable age <laughs> that probably will not be able to support themselves on the state pension. Absolutely. So the economists are always talking about the demographic time bomb, which yeah. is exactly what you said. People are not, at least they're not saving the amount of money they would need to continue the lifestyle that yeah. they had while they yeah. work. They're going to have to take a significant hit to the quality of yeah. their lived life. And that's a shock in itself. Absolutely. And so one of the things that you mentioned several times, there was this idea of self-esteem or confidence or, or self-belief. 
and that it's sort of driven by multiple things, including ageist attitudes. What do you feel and and uh, expectations around old age, self-imposed expectations around what old entails in terms of your day-to-day work? What do you feel needs to change in society? Well, I think w- w- what I felt when I was um, conducting those interviews is the people themselves sometimes were their own biggest barrier um, because they they were also taking on board these stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So they were also thinking, well, how can I, you know, what will my, what will my colleagues say? I remember reading a very interesting paper about a golf club and about, there was some research done and one of, one of the members of the golf club decided to start a business and he was ostracized from his fellow golf club members because he was doing something different from what everybody else. So there's this sort of attitude about about being slightly deviant if you and of course that has to change and I think our media um has to has a huge role to play. Mm-hmm. Um because they need to start portraying older people in a different light. Yeah. You know, we tend to sort of we because I classify myself in this group. Mm-hmm. So it, you know, so we seem to be sort of portrayed in a in a in a way which I've said is like the beginning of the big decline. Absolutely, it's interesting. Sam and I were speaking last week about kind of the existential crisis yeah. that's being faced by younger people yeah. at the minute, feeling uh, disenfranchised, feeling like work isn't really worth the reward, not being able to get onto the housing ladder. It feels like the the bookends of life are really challenging periods and they both have this common thing which is a lack of sort of confidence or in some yeah. ways hope yeah. that this is that starting a business is something that I could achieve and again to return to this age time bomb we're only going to see this demographic is only going to get bigger and bigger, bigger. It is indeed yeah and I think that norms are just going to have to shift aren't yeah. they in, yeah. in the response to the fact that they'll, they will simply be more visible older folks yeah. around yeah and I think that beyond the, the to just take the conversation a bit bigger than entrepreneurship and, and retirement and stuff is that the, the whole culture and the whole way that we do things is not well tailored to people of, of an older age, yeah. even if you think about accessibility options yeah. for buildings, yeah. uh, even if you think about the, the, the marketing, uh, Sam and I touched like, on this and you mentioned it as well, the idea of feeling irrelevant. Yeah. The music isn't about you anymore. It's not yeah. targeted at you. Exactly. The, the movies aren't... And you've got to shout really hard to get yourself heard. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, if you're of a certain age, you're only allowed to listen to 60s music yeah. or 70s yeah. Yeah. music and it just feels like... I mean, I feel... I, I'm optimistic that things are going to shift and attitudes towards the, towards the elderly are going to get better because they have to. I, I, you know, just the sheer fact that they're going to be more visible. They're the the people with, they still have money to spend. You yeah. know, so the companies will will still want to tap into them on some degree. And the, and the fact that they're going to become a bigger market share over yeah. the years is is really interesting. So but the other thing, could I just say that employers need to have a slightly different um, attitude towards older people? I mean, I hear time and time again still, despite there being legislation against, uh, you know, employment legislation against ageism at work, it still happens in a sort of, um, you know, in an unseen way, yes. you know, and, 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 and that has to change because I think employers need to understand that, you know, you might do it slightly slower, mm-hmm. whatever job, but that doesn't mean to say you haven't got the skills and experience to, 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 to deal with it. In, in and use that mm. and I think employers attitudes do need to change too yeah I think the employers attitudes but also what you mentioned as well which is people themselves and their self-belief often yeah. uh, some of these people have been in the same job for 40 years yeah. and when they're made retired when they're made redundant sorry the question is is there even anybody out there that would want me and so there are organizations like the center for uh, healthy aging I yeah. believe it is and they have things like the age-friendly pledge that companies yeah. can yeah. choose to sign up for to say that they don't discriminate in the recruitment process and that they'll adopt flexibility for pe- for uh, older workers and things like this. So 
Yeah. And it is about exploring what these barriers are. You know, what is it that it, it and it is, and this is what the, the later creator program does. It really breaks down. I mean, for example, how do you sell if you set a business in later life? How do you sell to somebody who is perhaps 30, 40 years younger than you? Mm-hmm. You know, th- that is a real confidence draining activity. Yet if you want to, d- you can do it. And there are strategies you can a- adopt. Mm-hmm. How do you deal with the bank who's telling you that, uh, you know, the house that you've worked for all your life, they want that as collateral. How do you deal with that? How can you, you know, how can you develop a strategy how do you do, you know how do you build up that resilience and perseverance and going back to the well-being aspect it is about maintaining good physical and mental health that is hugely important absolutely so uh, dr moore what is next for you <laughs> well i am uh, i'm currently talking to several organizations about launching the the uh, later creator uh, program um, we ran a very successful pilot in Scotland, and of the 15 people that signed up, three decided to um, not to go ahead with setting up their, their business, but went into employment, but felt that they were more confident after going through the program to look for the sort of employment that they wanted. And the rest have set up businesses you know, these are not big businesses, but they're businesses that you can run from home that give you the flexibility to do the things you want. But they are, they, you know, earn the the income, the additional income that you need. So it's very much about developing and carrying on with my work uh, in the Old Entrepreneur Alliance, yes. Very worthwhile stuff. So a couple of final questions then, because we have our student listeners on the programme. Do you have any advice for students who would want to start their own business? What would you tell an 18 or a 19 year old? You've got to feel really passionate about something. You've got to really believe in that. Just thinking of this idea or that might work, but you really, because what you need is that resilience and perseverance to keep going. Uh, very, when you set up a business, I mean, statistics show that the first couple of years are crucial. So you've got to be able to keep going. Um, and use as much support as as is out there. You will not know everything. One of the first things I gave up and subcontracted were, were the accounts in the business because I didn't enjoy. So as soon as you, so get as much support, go to all the different organizations, the Chamber of Commerce, the Growth Hubs. There's a lot of help out there, but be clear what you want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the second question is, if you could go back in time and talk to yourself, uh, what one piece of advice would you give to your younger self? Well, it, it, when I was thinking about my PhD is that you've got to start writing immediately. Don't keep thinking as I used, as I did, as I, I didn't have much experience in academic work, it's thinking that the next 10 papers might give me the answer. And uh, you always think, oh, I'll just read this, I'll just read that. Mm-hmm. So I would, um, I would, I would certainly advise just writing something every day, even if it's just for fifteen minutes. But just get used to the, because at the end of that reset, there's an awful lot of writing to do. Absolutely, yeah. I'll tell my PhD students to listen to this clip in particular. <laughs> uh, Dr. Moore, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you. Mm-hmm.